surveys and as an addition to experiments. And it allows us to solve some of the problems that we can run into with experiments that they're not ecologically valid, or problems with surveys where we worry about whether or not people are being honest in their answers. They're worried about what people think about them depending on the response. And so we can look at the design of pornography and romance as essential features of male and female sexual psychology. And so studies of commercial erotica can be very useful because they're shaped by free markets, whether they're intended for a male or female audience. And so when we look at commercial erotica, it really breaks down into two different fields, male-oriented visual pornography and things like female-oriented romance novels. And I know a lot of people, when they think about romance novels, they think of something their grandmother might have read. But, you know, Fifty Shades of Grey is also a modern type of romance novel as well. So they vary quite a bit. And it's actually a huge industry. Both of these bring in billions of dollars a year uh, worldwide. And so when we look at porn, or the world of pornotopia, what we see is a world that is shaped by short-term sexual desires. So the features that it has are ones that are designed to maximize access and opportunity. So it contains sex that is not about relationships, that is about a lack of commitment, there's no courtship, there's no mating effort, women are all young and beautiful and they're interested in sex without anything else. Um, and so from that standpoint, it can fulfill that aspect of male psychology that is focused on the short term um, and opportunities. If we look at Romantopia, okay, the utopic world of the romance, we see something that's a little bit different, right? We see a world that is about longer term mate choice and what men provide other than just their pretty looks. Okay? And so they're focused on the idea of the process of finding a man who's going to be able to contribute those resources and that support that she needs in order to raise children successfully. Because access doesn't really improve women's reproductive success in the way that it improves male reproductive success. And so there's an emotional focus. There is certainly a focus on the hero as a you know, strong, socially dominant male, attractive male. Uh, but it really is focused on his commitment to the heroine and how indispensable um, she is to it. Because one of the big problems for women is commitment, is finding a male who's willing to commit to more than just that one sexual uh, event. Uh, and we summed this up uh, in a book that, that Don Simons and I wrote a number of years ago about this, and we said that to encounter erotica designed to appeal to the other sexes to gaze into the psychological abyss that separates the sexes. Now, I don't want it to seem like that abyss is uh, insurmountable, but I think when we look at pornography that is aimed specifically at a male audience and erotica that is aimed specifically at a female audience, we do see very different psychologies at play that influence our lives uh, in the regular everyday world as well as in our fantasy worlds. And just as an example of how different these are, instead of giving you a visual example, which I was a little nervous about doing, <laughs> I decided to give you a list of top 10 movies um, for men and top 10 romance novel titles. And, and what I'd like you to think about is, is how hard it is to imagine one of those pornography titles as the title of a romance novel. And likewise, how hard it is to imagine pornography with the times of titles that you see for top 10 romances, right? That these are really reflective of how different these products actually are, even without the visual representation of that. Now, there have been a number of evolutionarily informed studies that have looked at commercial romance and erotica and pornography that have tried to sort of look at how these genres, what features of them really reflect these aspects of our psychology. Um, and uh, there's two in particular that I want to mention. One is this one that April Gorey did, which looked at the psychology of female made choice and the characteristics of the hero. Because even when we talk about romance literature in a sense being about the heroine, it's also very much about the hero uh, in the story. And April's analysis of the heroes of 45 romance novels that were rated by readers and writers as being uh, exceptionally good um, by the All About Romance uh, website, 
um, really classified, her content analysis classified features of the hero into three different kinds of categories. Okay, the first one was physical characteristics of the hero. Okay, that he's older, that he's taller, that he's muscular, he's handsome, he's strong. Okay, all things that might indicate his genetic quality, um, his good genes, so to speak. Also a category that focuses on his sort of social capital or his social power. Is he bold? Is he confident? Is he impulsive? Is he going to be a go-getter? Does he have ambition? Okay. And then the other characteristic has to do with his feelings about the heroine, that he desires her sexually, that he declares his love for her, he wants her more than any other woman, that, that no other woman is going to be as good for him as she is, right? Things that are all markers of how incredibly attached and committed to her he is. Because in the end, this is pointing out, these two problems women have to solve are finding a man who will commit to helping raise offspring successfully and finding a good quality man who's able to do that. And this other one is kind of a really sort of fun and interesting way of looking at what the actual, just the titles of the novels tell us about female mating psychology. And so um, Tony Cox and, and Marianne Fisher did this study of over 15,000 romance novel titles, and they really fell into eight different kinds of themes or categories. Commitment, reproduction, resources, right? Exactly what we were talking about in the previous study. And then some other features of male occupations that tend to be connected to either resources or maybe good genetic qualities, like Western, uh, medical, so lots of ones like with the doctor in the title, professional, royalty, so everybody can have a fantasy about marrying a prince or a king. Um, and then the odd one out is Christmas. And I've never really understood why that was so popular, unless it's that many people think of it as just a cuddly, sort of romantic, you know, cuddling together for warmth from the cold kind of thing. Um, but other than that one, the others really sort of clearly stand out as representing these themes of, of commitment and of uh, resource acquisition. Now, the added value of looking at porn and erotica comes from a different, for online particularly, comes from a few different things. One is that there are different pressures for online pornography. Um, as you may or may not be familiar with, uh, online pornography, some of it is commercially produced and some of it is not. Uh, and because of that, it can appeal to a wider range of customer interests. So we may get more variety in terms of what people are looking at that may tell us something about individual differences that we might not pick up from some of the commercially produced material. Also, Porn online is much more accessible to people in a general way. You're not going out and having to purchase it necessarily. You might have to purchase your internet access. But of course, many people in many parts of the world now are accessing porn online over their phones. So there are certainly many different ways um, that people can actually access that material. Uh, and then there's also the fact that because you can get these sort of smaller niche genres, we can compare them to the mainstream ones, and those things that they have in common are probably universal aspects of male and female sexual psychology. Um, but they as well can maybe point us to some individual differences when there are things that they really do not have in common. So there's going to be some utility to that, and of course these smaller genres flourish online. So just some information for you about online pornography that you may or may not be aware of. Uh, that at least in the United States, there's a new video produced every 39 minutes. Uh, every second, over 28,000 people are watching porn online, and 372 are typing search terms for porn that they're looking for. 25% um, of daily search engine requests are for pornography to the tune of about 62 million searches a day. Um, so, depending on who you talk to, estimates about online activity and how much of it is pornography and sexually related suggest that it is somewhere in that range of 20 to 30 percent of online activity uh, worldwide, actually, is uh, of a sexual nature. Now, who's viewing it and what are they actually doing? Well, if we look at some studies where people have surveyed people online, um, and their consumption activities online, what we find is that if you look at age-restricted samples, which are mostly college students, 
Uh, about 87% of males are consuming pornography online, and 31% of females are. Okay, and I'm going to talk a little bit about, more about that and what the women are looking at later on. Um, in age unrestricted surveys, so general population surveys, the percentage of males is about the same, uh, but the percentage of women consuming goes up. And that is an interesting question, whether it really is going up or whether the younger individuals are less likely to admit that they're doing it, which it comes back to that question about survey data and how much we can sometimes trust it. But what in, large, in the larger scheme of things it points out is that even though the magnitude varies, uh, the direction of that sex difference does not. The males are more likely to consume material of a pornographic nature online. And in particular, they spend more time viewing images and videos, and women sp spend more time on fiction websites as well. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, so what men are looking at? What are they up to? Well, there was a rather large study uh, that was done a number of years ago um, and was collapsed together into a book called A Billion Wicked Thoughts uh, that compiled data from over 400 uh, million searches for sexual content um, on an online search engine over the course of one year. 55 million of those searches were for sexual material and the percentages uh, and the categories are listed here. Um, what I think will probably pop out to you a little bit about what is uh, highlighted here is that age is certainly a relevant category for people in terms of what they're looking for. And so young is a category that, that you see pop up a lot. They're typically teen is the term that's being used. Um, but also one thing that we'll come back to later is the term um, MILF referring to older women and what people might like to do with them. Um, also a category that has a non-trivial proportion of people searching specifically for it. Um, and then obviously some female bodily features, breasts for example. Uh, the cheating wives one is actually quite interesting because it, what it looks like is that it's men who are interested in the fantasy about having sex with somebody else's wife. Uh, that that's what's really appealing and going on with that. Right? So really you're seeing some, some cues and categories that are important that are related to things like access to, for example, quality, young, attractive, fertile females, and perhaps more sexually available females, uh, like the cheating wives. Um, this data actually comes direct from Pornhub, which you might be familiar with, it's a very large pornography uh, website that publicly releases its data uh, on what people are looking for. And here again, you have the most searched for terms. And so these are not classified by category. These are the individual terms. But you can see again that ones related to age and fertility cues tend to pop out. Um, and interestingly, the MILF one also does too in a variety of different ways, including stepmoms and all sorts of things like that. Um, this is actually Pornhub's most searched for porn star over the last five years. Uh, her name is Lisa Ann. <laughs> Um, and she certainly displays a lot of what we might consider super normal sexual stimuli uh, in terms of the shape of her, her body in particular, but she would also fall into that MILF category rather than the teen category, and she was actually the number three search for woman in Mexico. Um, so popular here as well as many other places. Now, I mentioned before this issue about what the proportion of women who are actually looking at pornography online, and they talked about the survey studies. This is actually data from Pornhub looking at the proportion of their visitors who are female versus male. And what's interesting is even though it's about 26, so fitting fairly well with those surveys, uh, in terms of the worldwide percentage of women consuming, what's kind of interesting is that it varies by country. Right? So there's something interesting going on here where the larger numbers, the ones that are in, indicated in pink and blue, those are for the countries that consume the most pornography. So it's the top 20 highest consuming countries. And so you guys are on that list. <laughs> so is the US. Um, although the Philippines are, are way up there too. There's lots of other countries that are high consumers. Um, the little group that are on the side here, uh, this starts with Jamaica. Um, they're a group where women actually are consuming in higher quantities, but they're overall lower 
quantity consumers. And so if we have time at the end during questions, I'm happy to talk about what I think might be going on in terms of the cross-cultural differences. Um, but I think it's a nice illustration of the fact that, that you do see this difference between the sexes in the interest in the visual information uh, that you get here. Um, this tells us a little bit more about the most popular sites generally for men or women. So uh, this comes from that data mining kind of uh, work, like the uh, Billion Wicked Thoughts study. The most popular website for men being Pornhub. This has actually changed in the last year. So this is uh, 2016 data. Uh, last year, the last one on the list, the XNXX website, took over from Pornhub as the top consuming site. Um, but you can see that all of the sites that the men are visiting that are in their top five are video sites. So they're looking for visual information. For women, uh, you see a somewhat different picture. I mean, the, percent, the, the number of people actually the millions of people going to those sites um, monthly are lower for women, but also the type of sites are different. That here you have women looking at fiction sites. Uh, the ones in the middle, Stephanie Myers and Il Harlequin one are romance novel writer and romance novel company sites, but the other ones are all non-commercial sites that contain fictional stories that are erotic. So I want to talk a little bit about that because that's, I think it's kind of interesting in terms of what's going on with women. The number one one is called Archive of Our Own. This is a fan-created, non-profit, non-commercial website, as they put it, uh, for transformative fan works, which means these are fan fiction, fan art sites where individuals are writing about expropriated media characters from other sources. And if you look at the list of the top 100 pairings for that website, so that's romantic pairings, 86% uh, of them are actually two men. Okay? So the top consuming site online for women is a site where they're reading romance, erotic stories about men together, which is kind of interesting. The rest of the site, the other 14% or so, is um, heterosexual romance mostly. Um, this is just an illustration of the most popular pairings on the site uh, as of last year. One's from the television show Supernatural. The one in the middle is Sherlock Holmes and John Watson, from the BBC version. And the other one is from the Marvel Universe. It's Captain America and Bucky Barnes. <laughs> so certainly very attractive men. Um, but what's interesting is the fact that, that that this fictional site is, is where women are turning their attention online. Now, one of the things that's interesting about that, that this genre of male-male um, romances is conventionally referred to as slash fiction. And one of the things that's interesting about this is that we can compare that, what the women are reading on this online site, to traditional commercial romance. And when we do that kind of comparison, it can highlight these essential features of female sexual psychology, and then maybe hint at some of these individual differences, okay? Why women might find this more appealing than a traditional romance. Um, and here we have the, the Marvel Captain America and Bucky version, um, compared to a traditional female romance novel cover. Um, and sort of visually, they don't look all that much different. There's a certain kind of similar theme there. And so if we look at the common features of those kinds of romances, along with a traditional romance, there are, in both cases, love stories where they overcome obstacles to form permanent, committed relationships. They tend to be very egalitarian. They tend to be sexually exclusive. They tend to feature high mate value men, just two in one case, as opposed to one in the other. Um, and they also both contain often graphic depictions of sex in the context of love. So there's very much an emotional focus to the way the sex is described, um, which is quite different from the way that sex is typically portrayed in pornography. So there's a lot more extra information that you're getting about the actual characters themselves. Now, the other thing that I wanted to mention has to do with the issues around individual differences, because one of the things that an evolutionary focus often draws attention to our human universals and things that, at least in the mating domain, we expect to be true for all males and all females, right? So we'll talk about 
you know, the idea that the visual appeals to males um, because you can get all this fertility information and that the uh, stories may appeal to females because you can get a lot more uh, information about willingness to commit and the ability to provide for resources. But there clearly are individual differences within sex. And the internet may be an ideal place to look at this. Because, of course, people have a really wide variety of things that they can choose. So how many of you are familiar with the Rule 34, right? So it's, if you can imagine it, there's porn of it. Anything that you can imagine, there's porn for it. Um, and there really is. It can be quite disturbing, actually, <laughs> depending on your imagination. Um, but that gives us this wide range of things that we can really look at and get an idea about what is going on in terms of... Um, um, uh, looking at these individual differences and what kinds of things may be influencing them. Um, and so here I have um, two illustrations, uh, partially because one of the things that's also true for Rule 34 is that it's more clear in the material that's produced for men. Um, there is a wider range of things that are out there. And so at the top here you have a woman who's engaged in a sexual activity with a blow-up dolphin. Um, that, that's on a site that's, that's aimed at men. The majority of tentacle porn that's produced in um, Japan, and if you want to know more about that, ask me later. Um, <laughs> that's largely produced for men as well. Um, and so certainly that, that does sort of highlight the, the sex difference to a certain extent, but it doesn't really capture everything because if you look at this picture at the bottom, this is a picture of two Transformers. Have you seen the Transformers television movie series? Two Transformers having sex. That's from a site for women. <laughs> That's from the archive of our own site, and it went along with a story describing the romantic sexual relationship between those two Transformers, even though they don't really have quite the same equipment. Um, so there's enough variety out there in terms of what women are looking at as well that we can maybe get an idea about what's going on with some of these individual differences for men as well as for women. And so I wanted to um, point out a study that, um, that I did quite recently that is looking at this aspect of things. Um, oops, I went backwards instead of forwards. Uh, and this has to do with using what we found in pornography more generally to inform hypotheses that we can test then outside um, uh, the sort of unobtrusive measures aspect of things. Because I'm a really big fan of the idea of using the unobtrusive measures, um, although sometimes I do worry about the privacy issues around looking at people's IP addresses and what they're up to. Um, but Say, for example, one, one really good way of looking at this, and we looked at this sort of earlier, is this question about age preferences and pornography, right? I don't think anybody's surprised that youth is a major category for men looking for pornography, right? That a lot of men are looking at teens. If you look at, um, you know, pornography titles, even for the commercial material that's released in any particular year, you will find a huge list of ones, dirty debutantes, um, a cherry poppers the college years, which has made 50 different versions, I think, right now. So there's a lot of variation on a theme with that, where there's a lot of focus on uh, use in pornography. But there is this question about the people who are looking for the MILFs, right? That are looking for older women, and what's really going on with that, right? And I think that maybe needs a little bit more explanation than the teens, because the teens clearly comes back to issues around fertility, right? Um, so if we look at, at the MILFs as a group, one of the things that we know from studies that have been done looking at women uh, in that age category is that they are often more willing to engage in short-term sexual behavior, whether it's because they're in a longer-term relationship and are looking for something else with somebody outside that, or whether it's because they are um, at a stage where they really know what they want and they're more interested in exploring their sexual selves. But we know from some of that data that they are more willing to have sex often than younger girls who may be working on uh, focusing much more specifically on their long-term relationship that they're trying to develop. 
Um, and so it may be that men who are interested in short-term strategies might be particularly, especially young men, might be particularly interested in the middle-aged women, um, or the mothers, uh, in that particular kind of category, because they may see them as more sexually available, they may see them as sexual instructors, um, especially if they're younger men, um, and so there are a variety of reasons why we might expect them to be an appealing category uh, for male consumers of pornography. And so uh, Marian Fisher and I did a study where we looked actually at online consumers um, of, of pornography, uh, both male and female. Um, in this particular uh, example, we're looking at reporting data just on the males. But what we found was that uh, by combining the survey data with the sort of hypotheses inspired by pornography, that men that have a preference for MILF porn, that if they're asked what are your particular criteria that you think are most important when you're searching for porn, that they rank that up high, higher than they would rank something like teen, that those men are more interested in short-term mating behavior. And we measured this using a particular trait called sociosexuality, which is a measure of how interested you are in short-term sexual interactions as opposed to long-term. Generally, there's a sex difference. Men generally score a little higher than women do on this. But in this sample, the men that were interested in the MILF porn scored higher than men who were interested in the teen or younger female um, pornography. That it looked like there was a, a difference in terms of that. And there were a number of other differences as well that we found. In general, the high SOI males were younger Okay, so they're younger males, not quite ready to settle down. Um, also, their interest in short-term mating predicted how frequently they used pornography. They were more high consumers than men who had a you know, more restricted or a longer-term mating psychology approach. Um, they scored higher on what we called intentions to commit infidelity. So a measure of how willing they would be to cheat on a partner that was also associated with um, an interest in uh, MILFs uh, and also in, in, in having the short-term mating psychology. Interestingly enough, uh, we actually did ask about whether they'd ever cheated on a partner in the study. Now I always worry with those about whether people are being honest or not, but if they were being honest, um, and we can trust the data, they also, if they had cheated on a partner, were also more interested in the MILF pornography. Um, and they also did prefer uh, group sex scenarios. So um, threesomes, foursomes, those rated higher on the list for men who were interested in short-term mating and interested in, um, in older partners in, uh, in their pornography. So there's a variety of different ways that we can use pornography as a source of data for studying human behavior. We can use it in this way to inspire hypotheses and to inspire different kinds of surveys or different kinds of experiments. Um, and we actually, in my lab, have been looking at doing some experimental work where we actually allow people to watch different kinds of pornography and then measure their response. So how much it turns them on, as well as how much they might prefer, they think they might prefer to watch it. It's not only do you prefer to watch it that much, but do you actually react more strongly to it? And we're interested in doing a little bit more, also bringing more women into those kinds of studies where we're actually looking more at female individual differences in this way. Um, one study that was published a couple years ago that we did looked in particular at those slash fans, the girls who were interested in the male-male romance novels. And one of the things that was interesting about those women is that they had indicators of higher levels of prenatal testosterone exposure. Um, so they were also girls who were more likely to be considered tomboys when they were growing up. And so the suggestion has been that they are particularly interested in some of the dynamics that are different uh, in the slash stories, in the two male stories, than are maybe as common in the traditional romance novels, that that may be partially what's going on. But it also leads to an interesting question, whether or not women who are more interested in consuming visual pornography, because there certainly are some, as we saw in that cross-cultural data, and it varies between cultures, but the fact that there are 
maybe one of the factors that might be influencing that is also testosterone exposure, whether it's prenatal exposure or whether it's adult circulating levels of testosterone. And certainly there's some clinical anecdotal data about sex drive suggesting that it may influence some women's sexual interests. And so it could be influencing how much females may be following what we might consider a male typical porn profile versus a female typical porn or erotica profile. Uh, so, some of the things that I'd like you to take away uh, from this kind of talk include that taking an evolutionary or an adaptationist perspective on human sexuality can really improve our understanding of sex differences in sexual desire, as well as inspire hypotheses about individual differences. Because I know a lot of times when we talk about, well, this is what women like and this is what men like, we forget that there's variation within sexes and that there are factors that we can use to help us predict that variation and understand it better so that we might understand, for example, why uh, some men might like to fantasize about women who have sex with dolphins while other men might not want to fantasize about that. Um, and that as researchers, as scholars, we should take advantage of all of the different methodologies that are out there for studying human sexual psychology. We've often relied a lot on surveys, right? But again, if somebody comes up to you and they're giving you a survey and they ask you, well, how much do you like fantasizing about a woman having sex with a dolphin? Uh, you might not want to answer that honestly, or maybe you would, right? But we don't know, and there's always this concern about the social desirability of people's answers when we're asking them questions about sex. And if we use a methodology like looking at what people are consuming online, we don't have to embarrass them or interfere with their life at all. We can actually use data mining techniques to look at what they're consuming online without actually interfering in their lives at all. And if the kinds of results that we get from all of these different methodologies converge, well then we probably do have a really good idea that we know we've got the right kinds of answers for these things. If your surveys and your experiments and your unobtrusive measures look completely different, okay, something's wrong. <laughs> you really don't understand some aspect of what you're studying. Um, and so from this perspective, I think that pornography, for all that we often worry about it, or we hear people in the news worrying about it, worrying about people's exposure to it, and what effects it may or may not have, there really is a great untapped source of data that we can use and that we should take advantage of. And we can use it to test hypotheses, and we can also use it to inspire hypotheses that we can approach with other methodologies. So I thank you very much for your time. Yeah. We can therefore make a bigger reasonable and logical, mm -hmm. more from the perspective of evolution psychology. Sure. But there are three things that outstand uh, out of, of the, mm -hmm. uh, what I was expecting. First, that the quality of a man is to be possessive on the, under the eyes of a woman. Yes, the, well, then you want the man to be possessive. Yeah. Well, right, because if he doesn't care who you sleep with, then he probably doesn't care uh, uh, that much about you. He's not as attached to you and not as proprietary about you. And it comes back to those issues about things like paternity uncertainty. Okay. If you're not proprietary about your wife's sexuality, you might be raising your neighbor's children instead of your own. <laughs> Imagine that instead of gathering salmon, giving this talk, and meeting the state, mm -hmm. it would be a man. How would oh. we see things? Because I'm not going to be very courageous, but I think in the world that we're living today, mm -hmm. I'm very happy that people here in Mexico were listening to this talk. Mm -hmm. It's very important to think about topics that we never think about it, mm -hmm. that have been taboos. But I think it's even more harder in the states. Yeah. Given by a man, what would you, I mean, what would be your experience? Ah, well, you know, so, um, yes, it would be much harder for a man, I think, and I have um, colleagues that are sex researchers, and many of them have had a lot more difficulty presenting their work, getting backlash from students, from all sorts of other people about their work, because I think there's a perception that if he's studying sex, there's something creepy going on, and, but, but nobody assumes that about me. For all they know, I could be creepy. <laughs> but they assume that I'm not free to say men like porn and women like romance. That for many women to be like, hey, this is very macho perspective, no? To a certain extent, although if you read romance, it's just as 
horny in some ways as porn, right? I mean, it can be very sexually explicit. And for anyone who does that, go check out that archive of our own site because some of those stories super explicit. Señoras y señores, un aplauso por favor. Thank you very much.